Bonjour and good morning. My name is Brie Gulmer, and it gives me great pleasure to join you at this first French-German Tangible Interaction Studio to speak with you about cultural prospects for the future of tangibles. I wish I could be with you, but my wife and I are anticipating our first child, uh, perhaps as you are seeing this, uh, so here is my place for today. In 1996, when Hiroshi Ishii and I were working towards our paper on tangible bits, working to articulate a vision for uh, one future of human-computer interaction, we began by studying the richness of artifacts from Europe's past. We began in a Harvard's Museum of Historic Scientific Instruments, looking at gorgeous orreries, large and small, for describing the dance of planets through the solar system, objects for exploring and describing complex geometries, for capturing and transforming electricity when electricity was at its newest introduction to mankind. And we realized these were kinds of objects which could be recreated in a kind, in pixels, upon our screens, large and small, but that there was something very important, very precious, something that spoke very loudly 500 years ago and 500 years from now with the physicality of these different devices. And so to understand this better, I spoke years later with the great, late uh, Professor Kees Overbeck in the Netherlands. And he taught me about several prospects uh, for the past and future of product design. Being an Ulmer, I should have been excited when he introduced me to the work of the Ulm School of Design, 20 or 30 years in our past. A school that has uh, been very impactful. This is the school of the iPhone, of tablets, of culturally divorcing an object from any particular references. So it is equally at home, be it in Africa or Europe, Asia or America. But he also introduced to me a particular object or three, a particular bean cutter, bone and Schneider of a form. And this I used on my third slide, introducing the first conference on tangible and embedded interaction here in Baton Rouge. I asked, who of you know this object? Four or five hands, Caroline Hummels, others went up, all of the Dutch, none from the rest of the room. And so that could be a recipe for a terrible product, a, a terribly small niche. Or it could be a very beautiful prospect, something embracing local specific skills and giving form to something known to certain people, not to others. Let me think of the French art historian Henri Fosselin and bring his voice into this if I remember correctly, to a first approximation. Fossilon spoke about the destiny of the mass-produced object. Now we're talking the 1960s or 70s. The destiny of the mass-produced as being the trash bin and the destiny of the handcrafted, an aspiration towards eternity. This prospect about thinking, using, as John Fraser said, all of the powers of mass production, but towards the specificity of the handcrafted. Uh, to bring yet one final voice before we uh, work towards landing the plane. Freeman Dyson, a great British-American philosopher, uh, has written very recently, now in his 90s, on uh, imagined worlds, amazing prospects for uh, internet, meeting genomics, meeting solar power and beyond. But already in 1979, in his uh, memoirs of uh, Disturbing the Universe, he wrote of what he described as the greatest crisis and challenge facing humanity as a whole. And this he spoke of in terms of the English language and clades and clones. He said to a first approximation, in biology, a clade is a set of species that have a common genetic ancestry but have diverged enough so they can no longer interbreed. A clone is a set of individuals with the same genome. Ubiquitous, perhaps, but very fragile to viri, to all sorts of different influences. A clone is a word we used very much in the early 1990s, thinking about Microsoft and PCs and things. We've a little bit forgotten about it, while at the same time, in some ways, moving even more towards this idea of the one true smartphone, the one true tablet. So to me, I take Dyson's words again and look, what are the prospects for cultural diversity? I also think if Professor Overbeck were in the room, he might say, nice words, but poking a little bit at Don Norman, he might say in one of his papers, but how, Donald? Tell us how. How can we operationalize these ideas? 
And so a mixture of pragmatics and philosophy. When I applied to graduate school, 1995, I received some admittances, some denials, and one conditional admittance. MIT said, you're not quite ready. And I said, what can I study? What can I read? I'm willing to read anything. And they said, you don't understand. You can't get there from here. What you really need is remedial night school graphic design. And no pokes against my seven years at MIT, but that supermarket uh, Lebensmittelgeschäft uh, instructed uh, graphic design course was the most transformative in my life. It didn't teach me to draw terribly well, but it did teach me to learn to see. And it set me for the last 15 years on what is so often referred to, these 10,000 hours of learning by doing, of trying to give form. Professor John Maida, now the president of the Rhode Island School of Design, perhaps the most uh, highly known design school in this country, talked about what he saw as the fallacy, on the one hand, of the artist and the technologist collaborating. He said, you need to be both. You need to understand both languages and to bring both of those together in you. And yet, at the same time, referring back to Fossilon, of Overbeck, of uh, Dyson and others, I can tell you that my greatest pleasures have come from learning to try to do both, to give form myself, to weave the electronics, to weave the software, not just in theory, but to understand that, a kind of tacit knowledge, a favorite book of Mark Weiser he uh, gave to Ishii and I uh, before his untimely passing, but also in those collaborations with the artisans, with the craftspeople who have made it their life's work to internalize the cultures of their different native forms. And so, unlikely to me, when we were at Sony, Rekimoto Oba and I, when we wanted new objects, even though they were speaking of the Ohm School of Design, they worked with local craftspeople who would, with bamboo and shark skin and uh, bamboo uh, flavored saws, to, to handcraft these small data tiles, these other particular objects. When I was in Germany, perhaps my favorite tangibles are the Wiztisch, made by a retired German Tischler, a cabinet maker. I spoke no German at that point, he no English. But this prospect to bring the, the culture and the technology together into traction with each other, to think what is crossing many different bounds and what perhaps could aspire to cultural specificity. So with that, I would give my thanks again for many years of fruitful collaboration with Professor Nadine Rouillon Couture and Guillaume Riviere, both in America and in France. Uh, last year, many fruitful evenings uh, with uh, Jens Gilhar and uh, Johann Habakuk Israel. And uh, vielleicht uh, nächstes Jahr würden uh, sehr gerne uh, die Möglichkeit für Mitwirkung uh, zusammen mit dir, uh, vielleicht Deutschland, vielleicht Frankreich. But for today, uh, many thanks again. I wish you a wonderful studio. And I look forward to a French and German vision to the world and to each other for next steps in tangible interaction design. Thank you.